Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Quick History. Today we're going to be looking at the concept of British isolationism. As always, there's going to be a free handout in the description. Make sure you click on subscribe if you like what you see. And let's get into the details. Now, Britain, as we move into the 20th century, is in a tremendously strong position. Britain, by the end of the 19th century, has the biggest empire, has the most colonies on its empire by a huge margin. It is said that the sun never set on the British Empire, as it took nearly a quarter of the globe. It's tremendously powerful when it comes to its navy, the navy being essential to Great Britain. Not only Britain's an island, therefore needs to defend itself using naval power, but also the navy would defend all those colonies within its empire all around the world. And Britain had a great deal of trade links. All these countries within the empire made things, textiles and wool products and, and raw materials and plants that were all sent to Great Britain through trade links and the navy was there to defend those trade links as well. Britain as a result is what we call an isolationist country in the early part of the 20th century because it doesn't feel like it needs to get involved in international events, it doesn't feel like it needs to get involved in other people's business because business for Britain is good. Britain has got a huge empire, Britain has got a huge navy and it's got a way of creating huge trade links that go all around the world. Britain's navy has to adhere to something called the two power standard which means that Britain's navy will be at least as big as the second and third largest navy combined. Britain was isolationist and it was referred to as splendid isolationism. Now the question that we need to know as we move forward in this video is why did that situation change? And that's what we're going to look at next. So why did the situation change? There are four reasons why splendid isolationism came to an end. The first one was a result of the Moroccan crisis which we've done in a previous video. And what was learned from the Moroccan crisis is that a little bit of cooperation with international allies such as France could actually bear some fruit and could actually have some form of success. So Britain learned from the Moroccan crisis that actually being isolationist was not always the right way to go. The first Moroccan crisis was an example of what could be, uh, could be done with cooperation. The second reason why splendid isolationism came to an end is because of the threat to, to Britain from the German Navy. The German Navy, which was being built and Germany becomes a country in 1870, is a direct threat to Britain. Edward Grey is very famous for saying that the Navy is a matter of life and death to Britain. And he's quite true with that, because if Britain did not have the most powerful Navy, it couldn't defend itself and it couldn't defend its empire. Germany building up a large navy was a direct threat to Britain and something which meant Britain could no longer stay isolationist. The third reason is because of the formation of what we call the Triple Alliance. Austria-Hungary, Germany and Italy were forming an alliance in Central Europe which could form a threat both to Britain and to Britain's colonial colonies around the world. And the fourth reason why Britain could no longer stay isolationist is Germany was beginning to get involved in their business. The British were fighting the Boer War in South Africa and the German Kaiser was very keen to demonstrate support for the Boers and was very keen to show that the Boers had a valid cause in rebelling against the British. This angered Britain greatly. Splendid isolationism was based upon the idea of we don't need to be involved in anybody else's business they don't need to be involved in ours. Germany getting involved with the Boer War was a direct threat to Britain and therefore one of the reasons why isolationism had to come to an end. So how did the end of isolationism come about? Well, close relations between the British King and the French President meant that France and Britain became much more closely aligned and we have the signing of what's called the Entente Cordiale which in British and in English means the friendly understanding between those two countries and a similar treaty was signed between Britain and Russia. This is the basis of the Triple Entente, the second large alliance in Europe at the time. And Britain was now taking a more global approach. They saw Germany as a threat, they saw the Triple Alliance as a threat, they saw the building of German naval power as a threat. Splendid isolationism could no longer be the norm. Make sure you get your free handout. Make sure you click on subscribe. 
We're going to be looking at Germany before the First World War in the next video. I'll see you then.